Ali or Professor Leo, depending on, on who you are. Many of you um, may have taken Physics 560, and I feel really uh, happy for you uh, because, <laughs> well, it's an experimental physics course. Sometimes people don't like experimental physics courses so much because they're frustrating. And I do want you to know, you learn from somebody who digs into frustrating experiments. So, so when, when Leo was a graduate student, he worked on something called superfluid helium 3A. It's a superfluid, okay, that's really cool. It blows it up, it's got to be. But to see it, you have to cool it to below one millicolor. That's really hard. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you, Gene, for that wonderful introduction. I'm going to try to uh, um, not to be too much lower than that introduction. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Leo Li. Um, uh, I'm from Brown University, as you noticed. Um, so I uh, started here in January. It's been about a month. Um, it's wonderful that I get this opportunity to talk to you about the physics I do. Uh, you know, the frustration I have while doing it and the problems that keep me up at night, right? <laughs> so uh, it's been eight months. Um, we've, uh, the Nano Electronic Lab here, have uh, assembled a wonderful group of students. And with the help of the wonderful staff member at physics department, we have now have a uh, full capability of doing 2D material uh, fabrication. We have access to temperature down to about seven millikelvin and magnetic field of up to 14 Tesla, as Jim already spoiled you on. And uh, now we are traveling to national labs and while also developing new uh, measurement capability uh, at Brown University so that I can do the physics I'm gonna tell you about in the next uh, 15 minutes and or one hour, depends on how fast I go. Um, so here's the outline of the talk. Um, I'm gonna break it down into three parts. First, I'll tell you about quantum transport, how electrons move in a flat, flat land and then uh, the uh, special material, 2D material, which is basically just one atomic layer of atoms. And then last but not least, I'll talk a little bit about physics that's been keeping me up lately, um, the condensate of electron hole pairs and how that connects two different paradigms of condensed matter physics from BEC to BCS. Right, so first, I really have to make a decision on this. Let's do this one, okay. Quantum transport measurement, right? How electrons move in a, a flatland. Um, our understanding of how electrons move in a solid and our capability of controlling this motion uh, is intimately connected to our uh, 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 modern technology and also the frontier of fundamental research. For example, um, this is a processor that's seen every single electronic device uh, in your pocket, on the table, right? Um, it's capable of doing millions of calculations per second and with that, uh, with this ability to control electron motion at the speed, um, that's the foundation of, of our uh, modern technology. I'm sure all of you know this Moore's law. Uh, this is my favorite version of it. 
on the y-axis, it's plotting calculation per second per dollar, right? So back in 1930, right, the best supercomputer you have, you need to spend about billions of dollars to get one calculation per second. I can do better than that, I assure you. Um, but nowadays, we're at billions of calculation per second per dollar, right, with the capability of your phone or these computers. And this is advancement is correlated to the improvement in our ability to control electron motion in solid. And we are at a bottleneck right now, or we're at a plateau, we're almost at the limit of this development. And the next step, I think the last week's uh, uh, speaker talked about it, is quantum computation. And that's one of the directions I'm going into, hopefully, um, with everything we do uh, uh, on the fundamental research level. And for fundamental physics, right, we do the same thing. We try to control electron motion in solid. Um, although not with a processor, we try to fabricate really clean and high quality samples. Here is a bulk crystal of uh, bismuth. Um, it has the highest electron mobility in known crystals. And with these high quality samples, we can do physics, for example, um, charge density wave on the surface of a, a topological insulator or fraction quantum Hall effect in monolayer graphing. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. I don't know what that image means, so please do not ask me. <laughs> but I will talk about this a little bit um, if I get there. So as we start to learn how to control electron motion in a solid, um, we realize very quickly that dimension dimensionality plays a very important role. For a chunky crystal like this, right, uh, its dimensions are described by three parameters, uh, width, depth, and height. It's a three-dimensional object. It's much harder to control electron motion in this type of 3D object compared to a 2D object where it has no thickness. There's only width and depth. To understand this, it's important to understand this. And let me try to give you a metaphor to, to, that everybody can relate to. Um, you can think about controlling uh, the flow of traffic. right? We actually have a real life system that's two dimensional. Uh, that's the road. Um, and think of the cars as electrons. It's easy to break it up into lanes and tell electron to move this way on that side and the other way on the left side. And you can put up signs telling the right lane to turn right, and they're probably going to do that, hopefully. Or you can even put up traffic light to tell everybody to stop, right? It's extremely easy to control the flow of traffic with the help of all these uh, device or mechanism. Whereas in three-dimensional, you can think of a futuristic city or any futuristic uh, movie where cars can fly. Um, they make it seem really simple, right? They even give, give the cars left turn light and right turn light. Whereas if you think about it, it's a lot more complicated than that. The turning in three-dimensional is uh, 360 degrees of solid angle. So think about what you're going to signal when you want to turn 30 degrees from x-axis 40 degree from y-axis, and 50 degree from the z-axis. It's gonna, you're gonna have to pause for a while to think about that, and then pause for a while to think about which light should I turn, and then good luck avoiding the traffic or the accident. <laughs> so with this example, you can hopefully, you, you get some sense of uh, why it's much easier to control uh, electron motion um, in a two, 2D plane as uh, opposed to a three-dimensional system. So, um, that's what we did. Um, um, we started to do 2D system and try to control electron motion in very uh, intricate manners. And there are generally two different approaches, right? Uh, in trying to make better and faster computer, uh, engineers want to control electron motion really fast. They want to do billions of calculation per second. And that's equivalent to you know driving the car really fast. And I think that's. That's, that's why generally engineers are perceived as cool, right? Because when you, when you drive the car like that, it's pretty cool. You don't even need your hand, obviously. Um, and when it comes to fundamental research, right, for physicists, we prefer our cars or electrons to come to a complete stop. We want the traffic to stop so that electrons can have time to interact with each other and develop the whole spectrum and landscape of, uh, you know, uh, fascinating emerging quantum phenomenon that we, that's the field of condensed matter physics right now. <coughs> For example, a simple example of this is that um, when electrons are confined in a two-dimensional plane, uh, you turn on the magnetic field, 
the electron traffic uh, stop completely, but then a family of quantum Hall effect emerges, which is going to be uh, a big part of my talk uh, here. And as most of you have been in the traffic, right, um, you know what it feels like behind the wheel. It's frustrating, as Jim mentioned, that um, everybody who does physics knows how frustrating it is. Everybody who took 560 knows how frustrating it is. And I have conversation with students uh, about who are on the fence of picking a major in physics or picking a career in physics. Um, the reason that they are on the fence probably is because they have this image in their head. Can I deal with this type of frustration? Um, so this, this image is only the process, right? It's not the whole story. So to know the whole, whole story, let me tell you about quantum Hall effect. So let's start with the classical Hall effect. Without the magnetic field, right, in a two-dimensional sample, electrons travel in uh, straight trajectories. So that when you try to measure the voltage across the sample perpendicular to the flow of uh, uh, current, you get zero. Now, if you turn on the magnetic field that's perpendicular to the plane, um, because of the Lorentz effect, all the electrons gonna curve to one side of sample, right? It's kind of like uh, you know, putting up a traffic sign saying, keep right. And then when that happens, there's going to be a perpendicular or a transverse electric field across the sample, which you can measure with a voltmeter. And this uh, uh, voltage difference across the two sides of sample is the classical Hall effect. Now, if we go to, uh, if we increase the magnetic field so that the electron curvature is so large, it's just going to circle around, uh, do circles around. And then each one of these circles is a lambda orbital state. If you have enough electron to fill each single lambda orbital state, right, electron won't be able to flow anymore because all the possible states are, are occupied. It's like you have a road that's full of cars. So this is when the traffic comes to a full stop. And usually that's the end of the story for uh, any classical systems. But here now quantum mechanical dominates. Right? In quantum mechanics, something else happens. Near the edge of the sample, the electron orbit cannot complete a one entire orbit. So a electron coming here is just going to bounce around along the edge and then comes out. Even though the traffic is at a full stop in the inside of the sample. And this is the basis of a quantum Hall effect. You can think of it as an extra lane on the, uh, on the highway. And uh, its name is uh, 1D Lottinger liquid, or you can think of it as a quantum fast lane. Um, because the electron only go in one direction, any of the circle, they only turn uh, clockwise in this case, right? So when electrons are skipping along the edge of the sample, they cannot bounce backwards. This is protected by uh, topology. And this type of topological phenomenon means that when electron flows along this edge state, it cannot backscatter, or in another word, the cars there are protected by quantum mechanics against collision. So um, no matter what traffic, how bad the traffic is, how bad the road condition is, um, when you drive along this fast lane, you never have collision. You can always drive at 100 miles per hour. You can think of it as driving a quantum car. It's hard to find the image, so this is my imaginary <laughs> quantum car. <laughs> And when you're driving there, you don't even have to look because you know that you're protected against collision by topology and quantum mechanics. So right, when you think about phys physicists, um, at the end of the day, it's like this. You're always happy, where most of us are a lot dumber than him, but when physics works, the happiness is the same. OK, jokes aside, um, I'm an experimentalist. Um, when you tell me that there's a quantum fast lane, the question I'm going to ask is that, um, how do you know there's a fast lane? How can you measure it? Uh, what's going to be its experimental characteristic? Right? So let me tell you about that. This is the sample. All the Landau orbital state are fully occupied. Right? What that means is that the Landau level are fully occupied. Integer number of Landau level are occupied. And in the sample, we can do a very fundamental transport measurement. We just flow current in one direction and measure the resistance along the current flow and perpendicular to the current flow. Right? And then this is longitudinal resistance and this is whole resistance. And we can plot that as a function of filling fraction. The bottom axis basically just tell you how many lambda levels are filled. So this condition where the quantum fast lane exists is one, two, three, four, these integer values. 
that are highlighted by the red circle. Even though in the inside of the sample, the electron flow comes to a complete stop, you can see that the red trace is the longitudinal resistance along the sample. It's at zero, which means that um, even though electron doesn't flow in, inside the sample, it flows along the edge with, without dissipation or there's no collision whatsoever, um, regardless of uh, uh, what happens. But counterintuitively, when you move the filling fraction away from a full Landau level filling so that part, a part of the Landau level is filled, or in another word, that there's no traffic in the inside of the sample, this is when the uh, quantum fast lane disappears and collisions start to happen when you don't have a traffic jet. And you can see that by this resistance that develops here that goes actually uh, above the scale. So this shows you that this system, this is the fundamental uh, idea of a topological protection. In fact, it means that the electrical conductance of the sample is not described by the shape of the, of the object. It's described by its topology or how many holes there are in this object. Um, you can start morphing from a sphere into a coffee mug or a cup. Until you become a puff coffee mug or the handle fully develop, the conductance is always the same. And as you go from zero hole to one hole to two hole or to three holes, the conductance takes step-like jumps. Um, that picture is not supposed to appear so early, but uh, you know, uh, our uh, professor Kostelitz uh, won the Nobel Prize a few years ago by, uh, for his contribution on studying topological phase transitions and topological matters. And in this case, quantum Hall effect is one of the earlier, uh, one of the uh, phenomenon that studied um, the first uh, topological phase that studied uh, experimentally. And what that means is that when you have a sample that has quantum Hall effect, its shape doesn't matter. You can change that into any shape you want and the electrical transport phenomenon is the same for quantum Hall effect um, until you add a hole in the center of the sample. Um, if you measure from the outside of the sample to the inside of the sample, as you can see, there's no skipping orbit. So when the traffic stops, it really stops. And we can show you that by measuring two different samples. The first one is a square sample. Now I'm only plotting uh, longitudinal resistance that's measuring along the direction of uh, current flow at integer quantum Hall effect at these integer number, resistance is zero, right? Showing that the uh, quantum transport along the fast lane has no dissipation or there's no collision whatsoever. Whereas when you measure a Corbino sample, it's called Corbino, but it's really just a donut shape. Um, when you measure from the outside to the inside, there's no quantum fast lane connecting these two terminals. So when you have zero resistance in a square sample, in a Corbino sample, it diverges to infinity. Um, I'm cutting the axis off at 200 mega ohm, but it really is zero current or infinite uh, resistance. And it's true for one, two, three, four, all of these integer quantum Hall effect. This is just to show that um, the idea of topology is uh, as we described earlier, but the experimental fact is like this. Yes? So in the top uh, graph from um, one, two, three, yeah. the red curve uh, was uh, not a zero and right. bigger and then bigger. Is that right. the real effect or is it artifact? Um, so that's a great question. Um, when, when you measure two, so I should clarify that uh, all the data I'm showing here, I'm taking, I'm using my own data in measuring graphing. It's a lot easier to edit my own data. Um, and for graphing samples, the quantum fast lane or the edge mode is really robust, but accessing the edge mode is difficult. So um, our current understanding of why this deviate from zero is that the contact becomes uh, really resistive. So getting into the fast lane or getting into the edge mode will give you this uh, small uh, voltage drop, even though it's a four-terminal measurement. Um, we can verify this through a number of different uh, methods, um, mostly just measure sample with different contact resistance. But this is a very uh, detailed discussion that maybe we can have afterward. Right. So, right. Um, one last thing about quantum Hall effect, right? Um, from filling fraction zero, uh, one to zero, um, that's when only a, a fraction of a, a Landau level is filled. And if you've noticed that if you blow this up, there are a bunch of features showing up here that look like there are edge modes and the uh, 
the, the inside of sample become insulating and the quantum fast lane develops. And this is uh, counterintuitive at the beginning. Uh, physicists puzzled over this for like 10 years back in the 80s. And the reason that it's puzzling is because, for example, if you take this one third state, it's a very robust quantum Hall effect, but only one third of the lambda orbitals are occupied. It's weird because you can think of only one third of the lanes are occupying the highway, but the traffic come to a complete stop for some reason. Uh, it turns out that the reason for this to happen is because electron and electron has really strong interaction. So even though only one third of the lane are occupied, they are uh, forbidden to go to the empty lane because it costs them too much uh, Coulomb energy. So this is the entire topic on its own, so I just uh, touch upon the superficials uh, while moving on to where we want to be. So hopefully I've convinced you so far that um, when you want to study the electron motion in a solid, dimension plays a very important role. And more specifically, when you confine electron in a two-dimensional uh, sample, the uh, Coulomb interaction is much stronger, it becomes easier to control the electron motion, and uh, it becomes easier to make better and faster computer or discover new physics, right? And uh, we are physicists, we are very good at asking questions. We are especially good at asking the most obvious question, um, how thin can you go? What's the thinnest limit? And the thinnest limit is to uh, reach the extreme 2D limit where you only have one layer of atom, right? And so with that, we'll go to the next part of the talk, um, the 2D material, which are only one atomic layer thing. So this started many, many years ago when we realized that uh, dimensionality plays an important role. And people start to fantasize um, how can we make material that's, that only contain one layer of atom? Um, for a really long time, it was science, uh, science fiction. I think until about 2000, when you write this in, in, the, in the proposal, people will laugh. And, but people have plans, right? It's not just completely, uh, not just a, a complete dream. Uh, they even identify the material, which is graphite. The reason that this material is uh, uh, specifically interesting is because that it has, uh, within a 2D plane, the atomic bond is uh, very strong, meaning that the layers are very robust. But between different layers, uh, the coupling is weak. Uh, so it's very easy, relatively easier than other material to peel off one layer of atom. Um, they even have proposal, like somebody made this image, um, where you just need the technique to peel off one layer of atom. Um, and for 30, 40 years, they were, we just need the technique. And we were hoping that the, the, the technology will develop enough that will allow us to use a robot arm that's small enough to just peel off one layer of graphene, right? For 30 or 40 years, people dream about that, and then they even made the image, they did all the calculation they could, uh, even back in the 70s, that if you have this one layer of graphene, then you will get this, this, and that. It's a very beautiful dream. Um, although technology, the, the, the fancy technology, never developed to the place, not even today, to allow a small robot arm to go in there and pick up one sheet of graphene. Um, however, the problem is solved, as you've known. Um, it's not solved by fancy technology, it's solved by scotch tape. Um, the concept is even dumber here, right? Um, <laughs> if you put graphite on a piece of scotch tape and then you start doubling that, every time you double it, you thin the graphite down by a factor of two. And if you are good at math, you know that doing this by seven or eight times, you are left with only one layer of atom. So this is a, a, a picture of one layer of a carbon atom uh, taken in my lab. Um, the purple color is a substrate that's a silicon dioxide. And then um, the layer of graphene actually has enough uh, optical contrast for you to see that uh, with, your, uh, with your, not with your naked eye, with the help of a microscope. Because the, the size of the sample is not that big. It's about 100 micron by 100 micron, right? 0.1 millimeter by 0.1 millimeter. And the technique was developed back in 2004. And they won the Nobel Prize 2010, which is pretty fast. So, uh-oh, right, sorry, I was, uh, too many slides. Um, I came to Brown at the beginning of January, and uh, uh, this is the first lab meeting that happened, I think, in that direction, that direction, in my lab. Um, 
and it's about how to use scotch tape to produce all these magical uh, materials. And you can see D House face there. So it's pretty amazing. Um, it's been about 15 years since uh, the first graphene is exfoliated. And uh, uh, we have made some progress. We have made two major progresses. First of all, the, 2D, the family of 2D material has expanded a lot. Now there are like hundreds of material that we can thin down to one atomic layer in that limit. And so they actually cover very different physics. Graphene is a semi-metal. There's a hexagonal boron nitride, which is insulator. There's a group of a 2D uh, TMDC material, which are superconductor, semiconductor, uh, magnetic materials, and uh, topological insulator, topological superconductor. Whatever you name it, whatever condensed matter uh, phenomenon, now there's a 2D uh, material version of it. And then on top of this, this gives us the, uh, the reservoir to choose from, right? And uh, we've also developed a, based on this family of 2D material, we develop a Van der Waals assembly technique, which basically just means that uh, it allows you to pick up one layer of 2D material and put it up on top of another 2D material. And then it doesn't stop there. You can keep doing this forever, right? You can assemble a material of your own that's consisting of uh, any 2D material you want. You can give it a name, and uh, as long as it has really fantastic physical property, you'll, you'll become famous. Um, so this is a, a transfer station that, that's actually homemade. Uh, we made it here in our own lab. Um, it has the optical microscope allowing you to see different type of a material. It has the uh, manipulator arm that can pick up one layer of material and put it on top of another one. It has a heating stage so that you have all the control uh, you can think of. And with this, um, we basically are capable of doing that, right? Putting uh, different 2D material on top of each other. And this is literally like playing Lego. Right? Um, you can choose any material you want. And because the 2D material is so thin, electron in when two material uh, fall on top of each other, the electron in one layer are in full contact with the electron in the other layer. So by putting two material together, you're basically creating a new one. And uh, it allows us to do two different things. Um, first of all, uh, we can make a sandwich like this. The graphene is in the middle, and we, it's heavily protected by other layers of 2D material just so that we can achieve a highest quality of 2D material or graphene sample in this case uh, that's possible. And secondly, uh, it allows you to make a complex structure putting different material together and at the interface, new physics might emerge. So that's, that's what we do in, in our lab. And uh, uh, I'll tell you a one specific example of this uh, in just a little bit. So, um, right, the, the figure I showed you earlier, fraction quantum Hall effect in monolayer graphene, uh, this is made possible by the fabrication technique we developed. First, you make a sandwich of a graphene in the center and then boron nitride on two sides and graphite on top and bottom, right? And then you make it into a corbino geometry um, so that you can directly access whether the traffic stops or not in the bulk of the sample without having to worry about the uh, quantum fast lane. And then you get this spectrum of a, a phenomenon. At the top of this, if you take a line cut, it looks like this. And I'm plotting conductance as a function of filling fraction, right, from zero to one. So everything here happens within the lowest Landau level. And as you can see, when the conductance goes to zero, here, here, there, there, right, that means electrons stop flowing, even though the, 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 not all the lanes on the highway are occupied. And this shows you that electron correlation in a single layer of uh, uh, material really dominates in this extreme quantum limit. So with that, I will move on to the last part of the talk. I think I still have time, so I can slow down a little bit. Um, if you have a question, feel free to ask. And uh, since this is, uh, you know where to find me, right? So uh, you can also come find me after the talk. Um, right, so I'll talk a little bit about the kind of Um, we've tried other type of tapes, uh, <laughs> but um, so the answer is yes and no. Um, you can do the Scotch tape method and you will produce the uh, highest quality uh, material. 
but they're tiny. And uh, you cannot build a computer based on that, right? Uh, it's gonna take a student the age of universe to, to, to build a device that uh, has a billion uh, transistors. So the different uh, approach is to grow a atomic layer with a chemical vapor dep deposition or with the uh, uh, epitaxial uh, growth. But the problem there is that it depends on the substrate and depends on how the, the uh, crystal crystallize and you will have lots of defects, so the uh, quality is low. Right now, um, the two different approach are trying to uh, find a, a happy middle ground. It hasn't happened yet, so there are lots of work to do. Does that answer the question? Okay, um, okay so quantum condensate and uh, electron hole pairs. Let me first talk about quantum condensate and phase coherence, because that's the holy grail of uh, condensed matter physics, right? Um, when it comes to uh, controlling electron flow in, in, uh, in a solid material, uh, what matters most is how often they collide with each other. And it's generally bad if they collide a lot. That means the material is low quality and the uh, uh, resistance will high. And if resistance is high, it's hard to make a good computer, it's hard to do good physics. So if electron, in a general material, electron do collide a lot just because of temperature, right? Even in the best material, but when you when you are at the right quantum condition, the electron will pair to form a uh, composite boson. When that happens, they gain a global phase coherence, and in this situation, they do not collide, and the resistance drop to zero. And this gives rise to a, a, a range of uh, super phenomena, superconductor, superfluid. And to understand this, you know, you can think of uh, dancers. In a nightclub, when you dance like that. It's uncorrelated and it's hard to control, right? It's hard to tell them to move left or right. They're just gonna dance on their own. Whereas if you form pairs, these highly skilled dancers, they never run into each other if they're highly skilled. And uh, right, that's uh, kind of give you a basic idea or that's how I imagine, how I understand the pairing phenomenon, how pairing leads to phase coherence. Um, electron fermions, and for a fermionic system, there are two different type of pairing or two paradigms of condensate. In the strong coupling limit, right, the, when the pairing is really strong, the uh, quantum ground state is described by a superfluid. Um, this is basically the, uh, when fermion form tightly bound pair, it become a composite boson. The quantum statistic become bosonic. And according to the Bose-Einstein theory, at low enough temperature, it goes into a BEC condensate. Um, you can think of it as a, a pair of dancers who are dancing really close to each other because the attraction is very strong. And in the other limit, right, um, in the weak coupling limit, the best example is super, uh, superconductor. In this case, the fermions are, attraction are really weak, so we form a Fermi surface first. But there's, no matter how weak the interaction, they can still form a Cooper pair. It's like a, a pair of dancers that are dancing really far away apart, like a thousand miles apart. But as long as there's a little bit of attraction, um, they can remain, uh, they can still maintain the phase coherence. They will still dance uh, in sync with each other. So uh, Leon Cooper, um, who's a, a professor here, won a Nobel Prize for uh, developing theory, uh, explaining how superconductor works, most importantly, for uh, the insight on uh, the Cooper pair. In the weak coupling limit, you can still form pairs. Um, for many years, um, BEC and BCS are two different paradigms of condensed matter physics. Um, people think of them as a, a distinctly different phenomenon, even though they uh, have a, a similar phenomenology. In the superfluid phase, uh, the, the, the matter flows without viscosity. In the superconductor phase, the uh, electron flows without resistance. Uh, in recent years, there has been proposal uh, by the uh, cold atom community where they say if you have a fermionic system and you can control how strong the attraction is between different fermions, then you might be able to achieve a phase diagram where um, in the weak coupling limit, you have BCS, whereas in the strong coupling limit, you have BEC, right? This is fantastic because that it, uh, unites different aspects of condensed matter physics, and most importantly, in the inter intermediate regime, they predict that this will give you the theory that explains high temperature superconductivity, which is one of the uh, open, outstanding open question of condensed matter physics. How this works is 
as such. Um, the theory goes as in the BEC limit, in the strong coupling limit, because the coupling is so strong, even above the uh, phase transition of the condensate phase, the pairing still exists, right? So you have uh, fermionic pairing above transition temperature in the strong coupling limit, whereas in the weak coupling limit, because the coupling is so weak above the TC, the superconductivity disappear and the pairing breaks up. So that's a very uh, easy to test uh, theory. With this theory, they drew this phase diagram, right? There's this uh, blue line that's the TC, below which you have a superfluid or superconductor, and then there's dashed red line that's the pairing transition. So in the weak coupling limit, these two lines approach each other. So when you go through TC, there's no pairing anymore. And in the strong coupling limit, there's only one line too. There's a superconduct, a superfluid transition above which you have pairing. So you still have a both liquid. And in between, there are two transitions. When you go up in temperature from the superconducting phase, first you have the superconducting transition, and then you have a pairing transition. In between, you have pairing, but there's no superconductivity. They hypothesize this will give you the pseudo gap state. It's a beautiful theory. It's uh, um, lots of people are uh, stay up at night because of this theory. Um, the reason for that is uh, there are two challenges to test this theory. First of all, it's very hard to find a solid system where pairing interaction can be tuned over such a wide range, right? And then second of all, if you want fermions to pair strongly in space, you want them to be right next to each other and still be uh, uh, energetically favorable, then the two fermion has to be charge neutral, which means that it's gonna be difficult to, it's impossible even to do uh, electrical transport measurement. And that's a big thing because uh, I do electrical transport measurement. Um, um, these two challenges has limited us to uh, only cold atom systems where people have some very indirect evidence of uh, maybe the BEC and BCS are two paradigm that can be uh, united. But um, with access to 2D material, we can uh, have a different approach where um, I'll tell you a little about electron hole pairs in graphene double layers. So the concept is uh, such, if you have two graphene layer, the green and blue layer, right, and you bring them really close to each other, you populate one layer with electron, which is negative charged, and you populate the other layer with positively charged particle, we call them hole. Um, let's just go with that name for the time being. Um, so if you can bring the two layer close enough so that electron and hole will attract each other through Coulomb interaction, and then they will form excitons, which are composite boson, and then if you have large enough density of excitons, they will condense at low temperature into a condensate, right? That's the premises. The reason that this works, the reason that this will address the issue that um, other systems cannot address is because that in the bulk system, excitons are charge neutral, right? So electrical transport measurement cannot study them. However, in a double layer system, you can flow current in such a way where current flow from left to right on the top layer, and you can wrap it around and flow from the right to left in the bottom layer. And if you think about it, in the bottom layer, the whole positive charge will go from the right to left, right? And on the top layer, the electron that's negative charged will go from right to left. So by flowing the, doing the counterflow measurement in a double layer, you can actually access half of exciton and use counterflow to uh, directly measure the dynamic of this superfluid phase, even though it's charge neutral. Similarly, you can do Coulomb drag measurement where you only flow current from the top layer, from the left to right, and the bottom layer, if there is a really strong coupling, right, you will induce very strong reaction on the bottom layer and you can measure that and that tells you directly how strong the coupling is. And of course, if you want it, you can flow current in the same direction. In the parallel flow measurement, uh, everything will be, because it's charge neutral, um, you will measure no current, and you will give you confirmation that indeed you have exciton pairing, right? So it solved the issue of uh, uh, measurement. How about tunability? Because we have so much control in making our sample the way we want it to be, we can easily make a sample where the two layers are really close together, right? So electron hole coupling are very strong. 
or we can make a sample where the two layers are really far apart so that electron hole are very far apart or the pairing is very weak. And we'll, I'll show hopefully in a little bit that by just doing this simple uh, trick in preparing our sample, uh, we actually have access to a very large range of pairing interaction for the first time uh, for a solid state system. So we're gonna operate in the quantum Hall effect regime um, to see this exon condensate. The reason for that is that uh, we, want the, uh, we want to minimize the dispersion, the kinetic energy of the electron hole. Uh, in the quantum Hall effect regime, the continuous spectrum breaks up into discontinuous uh, Landau level. So within each Landau level, the uh, kinetic energy is quenched so that Coulomb interaction dominates. The electron hole will have really tight uh, binding energy. And the sample we make here, this is a schematic, um, the most important part of the sample are these two graphene layers that are separated by a thin layer of boron nitride. The boron nitride is an insulator. It makes sure that electron in one layer and hole in the other layer do not recombine and uh, vanish. Right? Because the uh, boron nitride is such a wonderful insulator, we can make the two graphene layers as close as two nanometer without having to worry about electron hole uh, pair disappear. So uh, we have potentially have access to the strongest coupling region. That's the, uh, in principle, the sample should look like that, but in order to uh, do electrical measurement, we have to add a few more details. Um, for example, we need to fabricate a sample into one of these geometries. Um, since we're in the quantum Hall effect regime, this exon condensate is still topological. By that, I mean if you fabricate a square sample or a Corbino sample, the response will be completely different. Let's first take a look at the square sample. It's called a double hole bar geometry, right? Now we're gonna do the Coulomb drag measurement um, where we flow current from left to right on the top layer and the bottom layer is grounded, right? Uh, I'm gonna use these symbol to, uh, to represent extant current, that's the red arrow, and the edge current, that's the black arrow. If you remember, the edge current is the, the current that flows in the quantum fast lane, right? So the exon current has to flow in opposite directions across the two layer. In the top layer, if you flow from left to right, in the bottom layer, it has to flow opposite direction because of the uh, nature of an exciton or the internal structure of an exciton. It's one electron bind to one hole. And then the bottom layer has no current flow, right? There's no current source. You should have zero current overall, which means that if you have exon current flowing from right to left, it has to be compensated by edge current flowing from left to right. Did I? Yep. And then if you have edge current in the bottom layer, there's gonna be a transverse hall voltage across the bottom layer, right? In order for exciton to be uh, in equilibrium, the two layer has to have the same amount of transverse voltage or transverse electric field. Otherwise, the exciton will feel a net force. If it's a superfluid, then it's gonna collapse. So in order for the two layer to have the same transverse electric field, we have to have the same amount of uh, edge current on the two layers. Are you following? Let me go through this again, because it's important, right? Um, exon current has to be flowing off of the direction, and the first boundary condition is that in the drag layer in the bottom layer that's passive, it has to be, uh, net current has to be zero. So that exon current needs to be compensated by the edge current. And in order for the exon to be um, in equilibrium, it has to feel the same electric force along the two layers, which means that the edge current has to be equal on the two layers. Um, okay, <laughs> so without grounding will make me really nervous because the sample probably will break. <laughs> but in principle, you could unground the sample and survive for some amount of time. And how long that amount of time is depends on where you measure the elect how clean the electrical ground is. Um, if it's floating completely, yes. It's a possibility. And when it's, 
And also, since the two layers are so close together, the quantum capacitance is very strong. So if you unground the bottom layer, then the quantum capacitance channel start to fluctuate. And then the signal sometimes become a little weird. Um, it's an excellent detailed question that uh, I was hoping we don't have to discuss. But <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so if you drive the current that's I0, as you can see from here, that you would divide equally into X1 channel and the edge channel so that it flows in the same direction on the drive layer and opposite direction on the uh, drag layer. So what does it look like as the experimentalist, you will ask, what does it look like when you do the actual measurement, right? I already told you that the transverse electric field should be the same across the two layer. So the whole voltage should be the same across the two layer. And if the exciton is a superfluid, right, you should have no resistance. So you measure on either layer, the longitudinal resistance should be zero, while whole resistance should be the same. So that's our measurement. Um, the top panel shows you the uh, longitudinal resistance where the x appears here. You can see that the resistance dropped to zero, right? So it's a super phenomenon. It's a super fluid of x -aton. And if you measure the transverse voltage on the two layer here, they quantize to one perfectly and the two layer has the same quantization. This is remarkable because that this layer has no current flow. You're not flowing any current through that, but you can measure a strongly quantized hole resistance. So that shows you that, uh, the, the, that the two layers are strongly coupled and also uh, you have a super phenomenon that's topologically non-trivial, right? Um, no net current. There's no net current on the bottom layer, although there, yeah. So the ground is only to prevent the bottom layer from being charged. Um, Uh, if the current flows through the sink to ground, then the sample becomes charged. What's giving you the energy to charge the sample? We can talk about this more uh, afterwards. Um, another answer is that, oh, let's talk about this more. Um, so we can actually do a simpler measurement where we forget about the quantum fast lane altogether, right? Uh, we just do the counterflow measurement where the uh, data should be much easier to understand. The longitudinal resistance should be zero, as you can see here, because the exciton is a superfluid. Flowing doesn't occur any, uh, introduce any dissipation. And also, if you measure the whole resistance now, it's zero. This is because that uh, exciton is charged neutral overall. It does not feel any Lorentz force. So the whole resistance in this counterflow geometry dropped to zero. Right, so everything is self-consistent and we have a exciton superfluid. And now, right, I think I'm running out of time. Let me skip this part. And now we can play with the tunability of the system where we move the two layer really close to each other. Um, we are in the strong coupling regime or we move them apart, then we're in the weak coupling regime, right? And so let me remind you quickly that um, this is the test we're doing. In the strong coupling regime, we're in the BEC limit, where above the uh, superfluid transition temperature, we still uh, should have pairing. Whereas in the weak coupling limit, the BCS limit, uh, the pairing should disappear uh, right at TC. Above TC, there's no superfluidity. There should be no pairing either. And um, Okay. Right. And to tell whether or not there's pairing, we will look at the blue trace, which is the whole resistance on the passive layer. If there's pairing, then we should have a whole resistance quantized to one, right? If there's no pairing, then there should be no whole resistance on the bottom layer at all, and we should see zero. So anywhere in between, we know how much exciton are formed and how much exciton are broken. And so in the weak coupling regime, the uh, wait, in the strong coupling regime, when D is really small, um, I'm plotting here two different measurements, uh, longitudinal resistance in the counterflow geometry and the Coulomb drag in the, uh, uh, in the whole resistance in the Coulomb drag geometry. At low temperature, you see that this resistance drops to zero and whole resistance go to one. That means at low temperature, we have superfluid. 
right? And TC is about <coughs> here, 3 Kelvin. And what's remarkable is that above TC, there's still a very strong Coulomb drag signal. And at about 20 Kelvin, that's about 10 times higher than TC, a significant portion of exciton still remain paired. Whereas if we go to a weak coupling limit where D is much bigger, you can see that at low temperature, this is about 2.5 Kelvin. Longitudinal resistance drop to zero, whole resistance go to one, right? This is super fluid. But right at this TC, this transition, um, most of the exciton pair breaks up. In fact, all of the exciton pair breaks up. This background is just the uh, momentum drag between the two layers, which is a, a complete classical phenomenon. So by looking at the, uh, right, uh, before I move on, let me, yeah. Is that cheap um, wait, so for the uh, whole resistance, right, it doesn't matter. It's uh, geometry independent. For this, this is actually just measured resistance. Um, we don't renormalize that to our sample because our sample usually has a weird shape. Yep. So before moving on, let me just uh, note real quickly. This phase transition right here is uh, not trivial. Um, the reason it's not trivial, it's called a costalitz dowlis type transition. Uh, it's part of the reason that uh, Professor Costalitz got his Nobel Prize. And to just quickly go through, because this is brown, right, I have to talk about this. Um, in a two-dimensional plane, superconducting transition or superfluid transition or anything that uh, give you long-range uh, phase coherence is not trivial because uh, fluctuation can give you these topological excitation that basically look like this. It's like a vortex. Uh, they, there are two different types of vortex, depends on how you wind the, you know, the phase angle. And as long as you have vortex or these uh, uh, topological charge, the uh, long range phase coherence are broken up. And uh, in order to restore this uh, phase coherence, you can simply pair two vortex with opposite topological charge. Right? As you can see that um, the long range order is restored just by putting these two vortices really close to each other. And that's the nature of this transition, but I'm not gonna go into that because it's an entirely different talk. And here, what I want to talk about is based on the whole resistance, uh, the whole resistance we measure in the sample, we can uh, estimate uh, how much exciton pairing we have, and then we can make a phase diagram that looks like this. Right um, On the right-hand side, let's just focus on the right-hand side, temperature as a function of a, a coupling strength. And the red color means that there's exciton pairing. And this dashed line means there's only 10% exciton pairing. Right? So now we define two temperature, which this one is TC, and this one is the pairing transition. And we can compare that with the uh, phase diagram that the AMO cold atom community proposed. And on the bottom axis, I, I flipped it so that on the right-hand side, strong coupling, because it's small d. And on the left-hand side, it's weak coupling, because it's large d. And you can see the, uh, this basically look like that. Um, there's a superfluid phase. Here I label B, C, and B, C, S, or the other way around. And then there's a large part of phase space that's bosonic gas, but this phase space starts to become really thin when we go to the weak coupling limit. And then in the really weak coupling limit above TC, there's only a uh, fermionic liquid. So that's the last of the slide. Uh, I will, because of time, I'll skip the summary. Instead, I will acknowledge the collaborator. Um, I worked a lot with the Columbia University group and also Harvard group on, the, on this uh, crossover project. And uh, um, I, let me give a shout out to uh, people, the wonderful students in my lab everybody who helped putting this lab together. Um, this is uh, uh, what happened over the summer when uh, we assembled the dilution fridge unit. It's a lot of uh, weight lifting. Um, special thanks to Daniel, who's uh, six feet tall. So that, um, you know, there are situations that require a crane that we didn't use a crane. Um, and uh, with all the progress we made in the lab, uh, students are starting to travel to various different uh, national labs. Here's uh, Xiao Xue in uh, Tallahassee, the National High Magnetic Field Lab. She's loading this uh, long metal probe into the 
Krauss that, that has access to uh, 0.3 Kelvin and the 18 Tesla. And this is Dihao in uh, Sandia National Lab uh, radiating microwave on electron in a two-dimensional plane. And the uh, weird phenomenon is happening. We're going to understand why. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we could do monolayer by monolayer. Would that take up thickness length? Oh, uh, so when we, vary the, when we vary the thickness, it's different devices. So we cannot do that in situ. So every time you want to go to a different D, you need to, right? Monolayer by monolayer, any time? Uh, no, uh, so we, when we exfoliate, the, the crystal comes out with different thickness, mm -hmm. and we just choose the one that has the right thickness. So for a 10 nanometer crystal, uh, we actually just pick up one crystal instead of picking up 100 layers. So in order to create the edge states, you need like low temperature and high magnetic field? Um, yes. But what is the advantage of increasing the magnetic field even further? Um, so the magnetic field gives you an energy scale between different lambda level. Mm -hmm. As long as this energy scale is larger than KBT, then you're in the quantum limit. So for graphing at about 30 tesla, room temperature is in the quantum limit. So that's the advantage of uh, having access to a large magnetic field. Right. So why isn't there a phase transition in the quantum limit? Um, there is a phase transition in this limit, but uh, because it's a KT type transition, you actually need to do uh, IV curve measurement in order to see that. So this is a small excitation measurement, which is why uh, you see that goes to zero smoothly. Uh, the, the, the phase transition is somewhere in there, and uh, it's, uh, it's hard to, uh, yeah. Um, I would like to say yes, um, but in reality, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, we can always uh, choose to rotate the two-layer by a certain angle, but after picking up, there's always a little bit of a rela relaxation process that happens, and we don't have a lot of control on that, on that relaxation, uh, although that is some, something that we're actively working on. Um, we, have a, we, have a, we have a new AFN tool that... Um, hopefully will allow us to, to be able to rotate this in situ. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, there's a, sorry, I just had a small follow-up question. Uh, the coulomb drag, what happens at higher temperature in the quantum limit? Yes, that's right. Um, although, so this is a high field measurement, and 20 Kelvin were cut off. That's the limitation of the, the yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, if I pull it to a low temperature where the nucleus of half of the electron can go around uh, the circle, okay. then quantum mechanics says that that the, uh, the right uh, hand going electron is equal to the left hand going, so there is no net current. Right. right. However, if I apply a perpendicular magnetic field, right. then the, the, the two directions are not related to equal, so then I will get a Okay. I, I'm just wondering, if I put a voltage total, would that be zero resistance? How do you flow the current? From the inside to outside or like no, 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 just circumference? Just, you know, I, if you were state the full total magnitude. Right. Uh, how do you tell the current to flow in one direction other no, than? No, I'm just saying the, the, there's now a, a 
according to common sense. Oh, I see, I see. But if it's a, uh, but if the wave function goes around without any scattering event, right? Uh, in the edge space, right? There's just an infinity of the cheap version of the right. Edge space. Then there's no dissipation, so you don't expect to see any.